Uh, there's a word that most historians have carefully avoided when writing about the Irish famine. It's the word genocide. It's too explosive for most because they say the Irish famine was not the result of a deliberate policy of genocide by the British authorities in the 1840s. It's more complex than that. But in his new book, The Famine Plot, Tim Pat Coogan has gone where others fear to tread. The famine, he says, was an early example of ethnic cleansing and one of the first acts of genocide. Tim Pat Coogan joins me now, along with Liam Kennedy, history professor at Queen's University, whose books include Mapping the Great Irish Famine. Good morning to you both. Good You're morning. welcome to Sunday Sequence. Sunday Sequence. Tim Pat, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, what's the evidence that this was an act of genocide? A large number of graves, for one thing, and an awful lot more people living in another country than should have been through forced emigration. A million dead and a million but more. Probably more, because um, modern scholarship uh, points out that the, through averted births and the fact that uh, families died and there was no one left to record the deaths, and that anyway, census taking in those deserts of Mayo where people lived in bog caves and so on meant that it was nearly impossible to just map how many people lived there in the first place. There was probably something like nine million nearer than, than eight when the famine broke out and it came down to something over six when the uh, famine was over in 51, even though hunger continued. So it was probably far greater impact. And you have to remember the impact on the society was, as I say, about nine million, whereas you get these awful famines that we see on the television in uh, Africa it's probably something of the order of 250,000 die, a quarter of a million. It's a terrible loss, but it comes from a population of 19 million. Now, there's, there's widespread agreement this is just an appalling tragedy, of mm. course, Tempat. Mm. Let's go further than that, how we explain this tragedy. Well, <clears throat> it was the over the, it was the detritus of centuries. The land situation had three million peasants living in mud cabins and mostly uh, to the left of the Shannon or, if you took a line from, say, Dingle to uh, the Foyle, left of that line, most of them lived. But they lived everywhere. I mean, tens of thousands of people died from famine diseases in Dublin as well, though people tend to say the famine didn't touch um, the East. And when they, they lived in tiny plots, which were rented out from what were known as middlemen who got the ground from the bigger landlords, many of whom were absentee landlords because the Act of Union had transferred the buzz and the government and the power to London. And uh, everybody of consequence was got out, the artist, the politician, the plumber, the poet, the publisher, and uh, there wasn't a government. And there they were on these tiny uh, plots, living on the potato, propagating, the thing getting worse. When the blight came, First, Peel, the Conservative Prime Minister, tried to alleviate it, and he actually, um, sub rosa, smuggled in grain on ships. And symbolically, the very first act of the Whigs, who supplanted him, was to turn the ships round. Trevelyan, the Secretary of the Treasury, who actually became the architect of famine relief, as it was called, and had the ear of the cabinet, particularly of his Chancellor, Charles Wood, he turned them round. And that was his, his attitude throughout, that the famine relief, uh, any kind of relief, had a repulsive element in it, as he called it. And uh, they went from feeding them in soup and so on to shutting food depots to uh, confining relief to be paid and task work on roads, some of which would be under four foot of snow. And you couldn't work on them in ten pence a day, and people died before the, the work started. And the constant refrain, he coined a phrase about natural causes, natural events, which became the mantra. And when, say, a humanitarian landlord like Lord Monteagle would um, complain about the effect of their policies, uh, he would, they would say, we must leave it to natural events. Well, natural events are, if you drive, uh, say, a vict, a grandmother and her children, uh, barefooted with rags, no rain gear, in a January gale. Natural events will take care of the surplus problem of population okay. very quickly. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt Tim Pat because I want to bring Liam Kennedy in, the history professor from Queen's University. Does this add up to a deliberate policy of genocide in your mind? Well, I waited in this book to hear some great revelation, you know, and it just isn't there. Um, it's anticlimactic. I could not see the great plot. And indeed, 
I mean, there is no serious historian who there believes are none that so the great blind famine. As they who will not see. Oh, let, let, let's, so, let's hear, uh, hear Liam make his um, point. Uh, indeed, Pat. Um, I can't think of a single historian um, who has researched the family, the famine in depth. And Tim Pat has not researched it in depth. I mean, one of the striking things about this book is the the narrowness of the evidential sources he uses. Um, and indeed, they're presented so badly. I mean, titles are misquoted. Um, you might even say the title of his own book, The Plot, is itself misleading. And indeed, the subtitle, England's Role in Ireland's Greatest Tragedy. Well, it was Britain or the United Kingdom. You know, and that's an old nationalist trope, England, the never-ending source of Irish ills. Um, it's... I mean, I, I find it terribly difficult and I'm not being unkind, to say, to find any redeeming feature in this book. And indeed, that's its only point of originality. I mean, it's it's outdated, outmoded. And Tim Pat, could I say, I mean, some... Uh, I was pleased to see that at moments you did engage with some modern scholarship, like Eol Mokir, the great um, Dutch historian of the... Um, uh, Dutch American and Israeli historian of the the Great Famine, but I don't think you actually understood what he was saying. I mean, you have a phrase at one point: um, excess mortality. Oh, let's let's put it more, more simply: numbers per cent per thousand dying during the Great. I mean, that phrase means nothing. You clearly didn't, didn't understand what he was saying. And when you talk about coffin ships, I mean, one of the searing images from the Great Famine, appalling, and of course, you know, I accept the, the Great Famine was a, a vast catastrophe. It's the title of, of one of my publications on this. But even when talking about coffin ships, surely you need to set that in context. Mm. The gross eel experience was appalling. I've been to gross eel. I've seen those graves. But that was not typical of transatlantic shipping during the Great Famine. If you had read um, Yol Mokir and others, as your uh, references seem to suggest, you would see quite clearly that Mokir says this was that first year of transatlantic shipping, particularly to uh, the mouth of the St Lawrence, was untypical, and that mortality on ships across the Atlantic was less than 5%, less actually than German emigrants migrating to, the, to North America in the same time period. So either you're guilty of incredibly selective reading, or, I just wonder, have you lost the plot? Did you really understand what you were reading at times? Tim Coogan. Well, I think what Mr Kennedy should have pointed out, by the way, from the start, was that one of my targets was the Irish academic historians whom I say and say again were guilty of the colonial cringe were largely trained in English universities as Joe Lee has pointed out, Professor Lee and uh, put this sort of uh, emollient gloss on it that you've just heard I mean an even more eminent uh, historian if there is such a thing possible than Comrade Kennedy uh, was the late A.G.P. Taylor the English historian who said that the famine made Ireland a belson, mm -hmm. a fairly strong term, and could not be termed other than a genocidal term in its import. Um, I don't know what he's talking about, about new evidence. I have reproduced, uh, I think, one of the most significant documents of the famine, which is the article that caused Peel to fall out with Trevelyan, and they were, had a very bad relationship for the three years between 19, 1843, when uh, uh, Trevelyan had visited Ireland for some six weeks and came back, briefed Trevelyan, or briefed to Peel secretly, and then went out and published his findings in a quite hateful document, anonymously signed, which showed a dreadful uh, anti-Catholic, anti-Irish, anti-Celt bias. The last man you would have wanted to be in charge of... Uh, Irish relief, but he was. Well, I don't, and, I don't may, think I, I don't, may I finish? Me, sorry, may I finish? I mean, we're nearly is, out of time. May I finish we'll my give you more time. We'll give you more time. My right, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the second point I make, which I haven't uh, seen our contestant, shall we call him, advert to, is that one of the factors in this famine was that some of the most powerful men, pa Palmerston, for example, in the English cabinet, at the table, 
were huge Irish landlords. And Palmerston said flatly to his colleagues one day when there was some perturbation about what was happening, he said, look, don't we all agree that the solution to the Irish problem, the land problem, is to get the surplus population off the land? And it is recorded that, quote, with a shudder, unquote, they turned back to other business. These were the people who imposed the opium laws on the Chinese at the same time and took Hong Kong. They had no, they were imperialists. They wanted yeah. to clear the land, get rid of the people, bring on high farming, as they call it, and install cattle farming instead of the Irish pauper and his peasants. And he hasn't adverted at all to the publicity campaign they ran, largely with the aid of the London Times, to get public opinion round to that state of mind, where they backed a policy which said, this is one of, uh, having welcomed the famine, they used the word welcome, they also said things like, we look forward to the day when a Celt will be as rare on the banks of the Shannon as a red man on the banks of the Hudson. Are you trying to yeah. tell me that that is an indication of benignity and trying to populate the land? Well, it sounds like bias. It sounds like uh, an appalling Fact. kind of anti-Irish perspective, for sure. And you have within that period a kind of Malthusian sense of the natural justice well, that's, of, of, course, of a very death. Important point I understand that. Yeah. I understand yeah. that. And we also have administrative mismanagement. And we have Absolutely. a lot of other factors going on here. But the, how does this tend to make an argument for genocide, a deliberate policy to remove by death, Irish people from Ireland, Tim Pat. Because he flatly said, uh, I'm talking about Trevelyan now, uh, how can we complain, he said this to Montego, I think it was, how can you complain about uh, our policies when we are actually achieving what we really want, which was an improvement in the land situation? And he talks about how, how much it's getting better. While people are dying by the thousand, we're getting rid of the middlemen. The real thing was to cure the land situation, not to fix the uh, appalling right. situation in the Liam, workhouses. Yeah. Liam Kennedy, is that the smoking gun then? No, well, I mean, that's the problem with Tim Pat's book. There is no smoking gun. It's a, a largely a misrepresentation of Trevelyan. And because the argument is so weak, Tim Pat needs to go back again and again um, to the 17th century, to Oliver Cromwell. So um, Trevelyan becomes the the Cromwell of the mid-19th century. And that kind of demonization runs right through the book. Um, and again, I don't mean it unkindly, but there is so little evidence. And the crucial issue, of course, is intentionality. If you look at the UN Convention on, on um, Genocide... The vital element. You can't is have an accidental genocide. It has to be a deliberate there has policy. To be a deliberate policy. <laughs> and By the way, you, I quote the if protocol. You look, uh, Tim Cat, could I, Pat, could I finish the point? If, if you, you look at other aspects or other comments by Trevelyan during the course of the Great Famine, it's quite clear that he was mistaken in many of the policies, um, too interventionist, um, but he was a workaholic. He was genuinely, according to his own lights, and we need to see, see it in those terms, in the context of the time, according to his own lights, he was trying to save as many Irish people from starvation as possible. Let me give one uh, sort of seasonal example. Trevelyan, and indeed it's in your book, in fairness, Trevelyan censured one of his officials for taking Christmas holidays because, as he said, when the lives of multitudes of people depend on your exertions. And there is no case for genocide when you think of, as part of British government policies in Ireland, three quarters of a million people were working on public relief schemes. I mean, that puts, you know, modern youth employment schemes, you know, in the halfpenny place. When you have three million people at one stage receiving soup from soup kitchens right across Ireland, mm -hmm. um, in their in their localities. But they then fact. close them down. I mean, you're talking absolute rubbish with all due respect to you. You do realise that a British Prime Minister apologised for the policies that you're defending. Tony Blair. Yeah, I am not defending the policies that, at the time. And I, we do need to bear in mind, it wasn't actually obvious what kinds of policies would initially work effectively to handle a crisis on this scale? But why would you shut this down was, soup kitchens? 
It, I mean, that goes back to the economic constraints, goes back to issues of economic ideology. I mean, it's very difficult for us to understand now. Even more people, difficult for the people who are dying. Sure, I'm, uh, I would accept that point. Um, but you had, you know, in the early 2000s, neoconservatives in the United States absolutely believing in ugre, unregulated um, market system. So this was laissez-faire economics. This was laissez-faire economics. That doesn't justify it. They use those policies to clear the land. And I have quoted at, in full in the appendix, you can read the UN uh, protocol on genocide. On I have every indeed. ground, every ground, it ticks the boxes. And I mean, it, I Tim know Pat, that it doesn't. I take did attack. Crucial... I know I did criticize academic historians for this bumbling attitude and obfuscating nomenclature that you wouldn't know. You couldn't really blame them. It wasn't really in Malthusian. It wasn't really what they were trying to do was really create a nineteenth-century version of the Scarsdale Diet. In fact, they presided. Mm -hmm from the year 1946 to 51 over a continuous process of the elimination of the Irish peasantry from the land. 1846. Uh, 1846, uh, I think you know. 46, is when, but, 46 but crucial... is when it kicked in. 45. Can, can I put 45, a point to you, Tim? Uh, remember, here, here's a comment Peel from Mary in Belfast. It. She's texted us. She said, Mary says, a British government document was discovered a few years ago that stated that the plan was to let the Irish starve, send the rest to America, leaving Ireland free to be planted by the English. Does such a document exist? Uh, no. Um, I mean, that's part of the mythology. One of the one of the great problems with this whole area is, is it's it generates all kinds of conspiracy theories. Websites. Um, I found myself misquoted on some of these websites. Um, it's there is a kind of famine commemoration industry out there, and. Tim Pat has let added me put, an extremely one, undistinguished could I put one point addition to, you, to this. To indicate, this uh, Tim Pat, could to, I, could to I to finish the, the point? Very briefly, and then Tim I Pat, you can people, reply. Let's hear, hear Liam, Liam's point first. Yeah. Go ahead, Liam. If he has one. Uh, thank you. The issue of intentionality is central to the, the whole discussion of genocide. In this book, you have failed utterly to establish that there was intentionality. And indeed, the facts fly in the face of that. Misguided policy, certainly, but um, f having three quarters of a million people on public work schemes, having three million people... Um, seeking or receiving food rations, that is not consistent mm. with a policy of genocide. And as an Irish revolutionary once put it, uh, uh, Ernie O'Malley, it's easy to travel on another man's wound, and that is what you are doing. You are providing junk food for the wilder reaches of Irish America. What we need is real scholarship, not this outdated, outmoded, um, and frankly misleading Commentaries. A final word from a you. Searing episode. Ten pack. I, just, I right. want to make a point about the Victorian Cromwell. Uh, uh, You've got about forty-five th seconds. That wasn't my description. That's description of a very renowned American scholar. The the facts are as I've set them out. They can't be denied. I, I suppose uh, our friend is not saying that they, they didn't really die. That they were hidden someplace. They knew in England for several years, long before the famine, that the land was overpopulated that they had these distress committees set up in the House of Commons. People as far back as O'Connell said what had to be done. When the famine broke out, they should have closed the ports. You haven't talked about the way food was exported all the way through it. He wanted grain distilling stopped, grain retained in the, in the country. The soup kitchens he boasted about, they had them for one year and then cancel it and put but them out in the road. But all of that roads. adds up to evidence that they didn't do enough to it's stop It's not this. only evidence they Is it didn't evidence do enough. That they they wanted once and it. for all to grapple with the overcrowding of the Irish land and behind the cloak. And the records of the, the London, London Times are there that I've quoted. And I think it ill becomes an Irishman at this stage, Mr Kennedy presumably is, to be going on with that sort of rubbish. <laughs> to this day, to show you the divisions that the famine has left and the fact that a lot of Protestants thought it was providentialism and said that to clear the Irish off the land... To this day, it wouldn't be possible for the National Irish Famine Commission 
a committee of which I was a member, the government committee, to hold a commemoration for the famine north right. of the border because of the feelings there. We and you've had an afraid. example of those feelings from uh, Comrade Kennedy's corner this the, the, morning. The time has beat us. My thanks to Tim Pat Coogan, whose book, The Famine Plot, England's Role in Ireland's Greatest Tragedy, uh, is available now. Thanks also to Professor Liam Kennedy from Queen's University. Thank it's just you. gone 10 o'clock. Thank you.